Good morning, Dr. Morrison. How, How are, are you this morning? I'm great, Martin. Thank, Thank you for you. joining me. I'm Martin Johnston. I'm a paramedic with uh, Toronto EMS, and I'm here to ask you a few questions about uh, the continuous chest compression trial. So I understand you have a lot of questions from the medics. Yeah, I've got some questions that medics have submitted to, uh, to ROC. Uh, I've also got some of my own questions that okay. were brought up to me uh, by some of my fellow uh, medics on the road. So let's, let's just go ahead and get started, if you're ready. Very good. Yes, I'm going to refer to my notes when I, if you ask me any questions that require data. Yeah. And the rest I'll just make up. All right, great. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering, and the medics are wondering, how are we doing on the uh, continuous chest compression uh, protocol? Great. Every service is doing a really good job. The, uh, we have enrolled uh, probably over 1,300 patients now. And we, are, we were the first site in ROC to launch, so we have a lot to be proud of. Um, the only reservation, the only thing we're kind of working on with the services now is to try to improve the compression fraction. Okay. And, and what does that mean? What is the compression fraction? It's literally your hands off time. So when you arrive on the patient and you start chest compressions and then you quickly put the defib on, what you want to see is the chest compressions are continuous except for the time it's going to be, it's time for ventilations. And so that's two seconds off the chest to ventilate if you're 30 to 2, and it's no seconds off the chest if you've been assigned to 10 to 1. Which Toronto is at this time right that's now. That's right. Yeah. And what we're seeing is that it's not uniform across firefighter and pro provider in any of the services. Um, but particularly in Toronto Fire and Toronto EMS, there seems to be a pause on that 10th ventilation, or sorry, 10th compression to give a ventilation. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to get rid of that pause. So it's continuous compressions, you just vent interspersed on the 10th compression. And so what's, what's the, sorry, uh, Dr. Morrison, what is the average compression fraction here for Toronto EMS and what is our goal? What do we have to meet? Right, so I have that data. So currently right now, um, for data that was collected since June 3rd, or as of June 3rd, the compression fraction with Toronto EMS is about 0.58 and about 0.61 with Toronto Fire. So those are low. When you're in the continuous compression arm, that's the 10 to 1 arm, yep. it should be greater than 0.75. So we're low. When we look at why we're low, one of the things is that when you tell me you started chest compressions, you usually estimated that mm -hmm. by when you arrived on the patient in your watch, right? Yeah. And then we tell you to get that defib on as fast as you possibly can because this is a very inaccurate time. It's plus or minus 60 seconds. Mm -hmm. So you want the defib with the pads on the patient as fast as you possibly can to pick up that CPR. If you dilly-dally and leave it for two to three minutes, then all that chest compression that you did, that may be great quality, good hands-on time, all the rest, is not recorded. So when you finally do get it on, they only take the first six minutes from when you said you started CPR, because that's the first six okay. minutes is the most important to the patient. So again, the key is getting the pads on so we can get start the, the recording on. process as early exactly. as possible. And if you use your watch to tell, then try to be as accurate as you possibly can, or get the pads on as quickly as mm -hmm. possible so that when you're doing your documentation, you can defer to the pads on time. We're just turning on the, the Zoll as CPR is getting started, uh, it starts the clock on the Zoll by just turning it on, Correct. right? So if we just start the Zoll up while the medic gets the pads out, starts taking them out of the package, because yep. all that takes time. Yeah, it's helpful. That, that would mark the time of that CPR would mark started, your time. right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Anything you can use in the scene to help you get better documentation that's simple and seems to make sense to you, you will do repetitively. Mm -hmm. So if that works for you, you arrive on scene, you, confirm cardiac arrest, start chest compressions, turn the defib on, get the pads on as fast as possible. The second thing we, that drops the compression fraction is any hands-off time. So if you stop to move the patient or stop to, for some reason to reconfigure or reintubate or change the way you're doing ventilations, both of those things will adversely affect your compression fraction. Mm -hmm. The first six minutes, it's all about chest compressions. Okay. So it's all about compressing the chest and putting the defib on as fast as you possibly can. Thank you. Um, 
Maybe it's because we've been going from one study to another, of a 10 to 1, 30 to 1, uh, automatic mode, 30 manual, to two. or 30 to 2, thank you. Uh, automatic mode versus manual mode for ACPs or PCPs. Can you clear out any confusion in regards to, let's say, let's start with doing two minutes of upfront CPR. Are we still doing this no. right now? No, we stopped doing two minutes of upfront CPR probably five years ago. Just before we start, we trained for Rock Primed, mm -hmm. which compared 30 seconds or analyze early yep. to three minutes or analyze late. Um, so there was no chest compressions of two minutes before you put the defib on or any of that. It's all been put behind us. Okay. And now, since Rock Prime was published and it showed no difference between the two, and there was a trend towards analyze early working better mm -hmm. in patients who'd had bystander CPR, all the services have converted to analyze as soon as the pads hit the chest. So that's where we are at no more two minutes of upfront CPR. And are, are ACPs still using the analyze button on the monitor or are they analyzing with their skill and knowledge base? So ACPs and PCPs can, are both can use it in automatic mode. Um, the ACP has the choice to put it in manual mode if they like. And in manual mode, what we've trained in a CME maybe two CMEs ago, mm -hmm. we trained you only to take the stop compressions for five seconds, up the maximum of five seconds to recognize VF, get back on the chest, okay. then charge and take the hands off the chest only to shock. So again, this is to improve this compression fraction. Correct. Right. So the so that requires chest compressing. Excuse me, chest compressions through charging, and that's it. I'm not sure that's being done as uniformly as we'd like it in Toronto EMS and Toronto Fire and Durham EMS. And so hands hands remain on the chest while the monitor is charging, charging. if the monitor is not already charged. That's correct. Some monitors, I believe, are. Have a ready charge Have a ready charge, yeah. In fact, none of them do right now. Oh, really? Martin, they were okay. supposed to, but um, and they were in place in Halton and Peel, this ready charge yeah, software. Yeah, we talked about it in and CME. And we talked yeah. about it in CME, exactly. So ready charge is a software upgrade from Zoll that Peel and Halton had in place, but it was taken off their vehicles in December. Toronto was supposed to get it when it went back on the vehicles for Peel and Halton, mm -hmm. but Seoul hasn't solved the problem. So ready charge is not out there for anybody. Okay. So we're all subject to that long charging interval, and that's why we got to get back on the chest. And I don't think that's being done as well as we could do it. And it's safe for the paramedics it's to be on the chest while the monitor is charging until someone puts their finger yeah. on that button. And in fact, Mississauga Fire, Brampton Fire, Halton EMS and Peel EMS have been compressing through charging now for nearly a year and a half. Okay. And no side effects, no problems, and they have the shortest pre-shock pause. So what do I mean by that? When you um, start the analysis phase in the automatic mode, your mm -hmm. hands come off the chest, the defib is now analyzing. That can take up to 20 seconds where your hands are not on the chest and the machine is running two different algorithms yeah. to actually confirm whether it needs to shock. Then when it has to, then it determines a shock, it now takes another nine seconds to charge the capacitor and deliver the shock. So you've been almost off the check about 30 seconds. So it's very hard to have a high compression fraction when you've been standing, not mm -hmm. doing chest compressions, mm -hmm. waiting for the defibrillator to do, to do its business. So by putting your hands back on the chest during that nine second charge, you've reduced it to just 20 seconds off the chest, so your compression fraction is going to be better. Why is a short pre-shock pause good? Because we know from all your data in the previous trial in Rock Primed, the shorter the pre-shock pause, the more likely that, VF, that shock will convert VF, and the more likely the patient is to survive. So that's why I say if you're in manual mode, Take five seconds to determine, get your hands back on the chest. If you're in automatic mode, get your hands back on the chest during charging. Okay. And you'll keep your pre-shock pause as short as possible. Uh, how will the continuous chest compression trial benefit our patients? So we're just trialing Seattle versus, to, versus the rest of the world. So 30 to 2 is what the rest of the world does. Seattle does 10 to 1. Seattle has the best survival in the world. 
So there must be something to this. And that's why if we can trial it in a randomized way and we can demonstrate to the world that 10 to 1 is in fact better, mm -hmm. then we'll adopt that worldwide and it'll be better for our patients. It might just be the rainy weather too. It could be the rain in Seattle. <laughs> um, in regards to the, the letters that medics get, I, I've heard some medics talk about a delay in, in receiving a, a letter. I know some medics take great pride in receiving that letter and they look at the data. Right. And then I've, got, I've gotten some medics tell me that I had a patient who survived. I have yet to get that letter. Why right. are those letters taking longer? Okay. So it, um, if the patient dies in the field, the letters get out much faster because we see the notation by the paramedic. We can generate the letter, add the computer-generated mm -hmm. data, get them out. If the patient gets transported to hospital, we trigger a in-hospital coordinator to go into medical records and pull all the data from the chart. If the patient gets transferred to one or another hospital as part of their in-hospital stay, then another in-hospital coordinator at the other hospital gets involved. And you can imagine if somebody gets transferred for PCI to one hospital and transferred for EP studies at another hospital, mm -hmm. then now we have three in-hospital coordinators. The in-hospital coordinators are held to a performance benchmark. They must get us all the data on your patients within 28 days of the event. And the reason it's 28 days is it's tough for these hospitals to pull all the chart together in a way that you can review it and get mm -hmm. all the data. So the hospital itself is a rate limiting step. And if we wait 28 days for 90% of the cases, then usually the chart is complete and we can get all the data. Okay, thank you. Um, why is it important for the medics to upload their defibrillator data and their CPR waveform data? Right. So we know that the pre-shock pause, the compression fraction, um, are both determined, and we now know heart rate, the compression rate, and the compression depth, those four indices that come from the defibrillator, we know that they are correlated with survival. So the more feedback we can give the medic, preferably at the time of the cardiac arrest, but even so, even data after the cardiac arrest is helpful. The more feedback we can give to the medic, the more we can refine your skills in cardiac arrest. That's the whole, the, even if we weren't doing a study, we should be providing this kind of data to you, such that you can perfect the way you conduct cardiac arrests and optimize those four metrics. Um, if, if, if you don't send us the data, we can't give you the feedback. And in order to change behavior, mm -hmm. you need feedback. Absolutely. Uh, what is done with the defibrillator and CPR data once it's uploaded, once it reaches your office, other than generating letters of feedback? What is done with this data? So it's stored, the, because it's in research, it's stored for confidentiality purposes on the website. Um, once the case is complete, then we block out all the identifiers. And uh, the data is accessible to research and to, um, to those who have passed sort of the privacy, uh, the requirements for privacy. Um, it doesn't go to the base hospital and it doesn't go to the operator. It's mm -hmm. accessible on our website only for those who, press, who have fulfilled the privacy requirements and are, res are approved by rescue. Okay. Uh, so the only way you're going to get this kind of data is from rescue, is from the research team. Okay, very good. Um, now, I'm, I want to talk a little bit about the technological issues that medics are sometimes faced with uploading data. And of what you know of our cardiac monitors, because I know you deal with multiple services who use multiple machines, different machines, what's important at Toronto EMS so that medics are able to upload their data? What do they have to do? So, I'm just going to answer the question broadly and then I'm going to Absolutely. focus on Toronto yeah. EMS. So, each service is different. Halton is an electronic service similar to Toronto, where at the end of the, f the defib jumps to the laptop and the data transfers to the server and then comes to rescue. Peel, on the other hand, uses the card, similar to what Toronto EMS has to have. It has to have a card, a data mm -hmm. card that's working properly. Um, all those three services, Halton, Peel, and Toronto, all require the green hair dryer. So you have to have the green hair dryer attached to your, mm -hmm. your uh, ECG cables. Um, and which then is attached to the defib, and you need that data to upload to the laptop at the end. And um, whereas in Peel, 
Peel doesn't transfer its data via the laptop. It actually takes the card out, puts it in an envelope, and a supervisor takes it and uploads the data. So each service has its own idiosyncrasies mm -hmm. and its own challenges. Toronto EMS has a challenge in that the DFIB has to talk to the laptop and it has to upload. In order for the data to be captured in the first place, the card has to be clean, has to be cleared of all data, and ready to accept data. It also has to be a normally functioning card, can't be corrupt. And the fourth thing that needs to be in place is the green hair dryer. Mm -hmm. If you've got a clean, non-corrupt card that's in the DFib at the start of the cardiac arrest, you've used the green hair dryer, and you upload it to your laptop, the data will flow. So when you say clean, I just want to make it clear is that the card was, was erased prior to the call. So after every call, the medics are, are supposed to erase their cards, after right? After every that's, call. That, that's what you mean by that clean. That is correct. Okay. Yeah. Can we clarify, you spoke about the, the green hair dryer. Mm -hmm. and I was here when it first came around a few years ago and it was like an engineered little piece of plastic with some hot tape glue on and yeah. tape on it and all that. And yeah. it's bulky, it's heavy. Is there a better way? There is. So you drew for me the, before this the green hair yeah. dryer and how big and how cumbersome and it doesn't fit in the bag properly and it's heavy, its weight mm -hmm. is heavy. Um, but they're now EM, Toronto EMS has now purchased what Durham EMS has, which are these tiny little triangles, mm -hmm. which now are the real thing. This was an engineering prototype because we were way ahead of the world yeah. in terms of capturing CPR process. And so now we have these tiny little triangles, lightweight. They stay on the ECG cables all the time, easy to fit in the bag. So if you're still using the green hair dryer, ask your supervisor for a, a, a light triangle. Okay. Dr. Morrison, in regards to continuous compression, chest compression, is there anything else you'd like to clarify? Okay, so I'm just thinking to myself that I probably wasn't as clear as I could have been in the interview about how to get your chest compressions, um, your chest compression fraction up as high as possible. And it all is because of that pre-shock pre pause. So if I could just uh, reiterate, um, it's really important to identify the patients in cardiac arrest, start chest compressions, and get the defib on as fast as you can so that you are collecting those first six minutes of compressions, whether they're done by fire, PCP, or ACP. The second key piece is, regardless of whether you're in manual or automatic mode, your hands off the chest has to be as short as possible. So only during analysis should your hands be off the chest. You should be compressing through charging and a quick lift off just for the shock. If you do those two things, your compression factor will be higher. What is the research team uh, looking for to identify continuous compression? So we're, we're looking at hands off time. So we look at any interruption any period of time on the CPR tracing where there's no chest compressions being done. And all those count against you in terms of the compression fraction. If you're doing 10 to 1 really well, you should achieve a compression fraction of 0.75 or greater. Mm -hmm. If you're doing 30 to 2 well, you should have a compression fraction greater than 0.6. Because 30 to 2 mandates that your hands come off the chest while you ventilate two breaths, right? Yeah. Where in 10 to 1, it's continuous. So they are a lot, you can get a much higher compression fraction with 10 to 1. This is why Seattle thinks they save more lives, because their hands are on the chest all the time. They don't stop for anything. Okay. The things, that are, just if I could comment, that what I see across all the services, the interruptions are either moving the patient or ventilating the mm -hmm. patient or intubating. So ventilating and intubating are easy fixes. You don't stop, except in 30 to 2, and then you only stop for two seconds to ventilate. You should never stop to intubate. Mm -hmm. And when you're moving the patients, that's at the discretion of the medic. But remember, the more time's off the chest, the lower the compression fraction. Yeah, I think to, for as far as moving the patients goes, the medics can refer back to the BLS standard patient care for their standards uh, as far as hands off the chest in, in that book. Um, thank you very much for answering my questions this morning, Dr. Morrison. No worries. And uh, thank you for taking the time. My pleasure.